Hi folks, today I'm going to be talking about a couple of asteroids. The first one is 2000 FL10. It made a close approach by Earth earlier this week, but it actually missed us by a good amount, though you wouldn't know it from reading all the sensationalistic headlines about an asteroid narrowly missing Earth and all the devastation it would cause if it happened to hit us. So, it actually missed us by almost 66 times the distance to the Moon, and there have actually been larger asteroids that have actually come closer to Earth in the last year but I don't recall reading any stories about how asteroid 2004 JN13 was about to destroy all life on Earth. But for whatever reason, some journalists will go onto the close approach list and just pick an asteroid, almost at random, that's coming up in the near future, and start writing stories about it. Basically, during a slow news cycle and they've got nothing else to write about, they'll just pick one of these things and fixate on it. And then their stories get copied, and their stories get copied, and before you know it, their stories about how an asteroid is almost wiping us out, even if the past isn't all that remarkable at all. But there are interesting asteroids that do present very real threats to the planet. In fact, we know about hundreds of them at any given time that could potentially hit Earth in the future. And in fact, one of these is coming up in the very near future. And it hasn't made uh, many waves yet, but asteroid 2015 HR 182 was discovered earlier this year and is set to make a close approach this month. Now, it says here on this title of this video that the closest approach was on October 13th, but that's not necessarily true. We're going to get into that in a minute. But this asteroid actually might hit Earth. It's extraordinarily unlikely. We're talking about uh, a percentage chance of impact of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 11th percent chance. I mean, we're talking about very, very small odds here. But it is a reasonably large asteroid. We're talking about uh, somewhere between uh, probably three and 600 meters in size. And it is set to make a close approach sometime this month. Now, as to exactly when, well, we have to do some analysis of the orbit here. Unfortunately, the orbit is extremely uncertain, which is why it's possible that it could hit Earth. It's not completely impossible. We know only a little bit about the orbit, so we can't say for certain whether or not an impact will happen. We were able to say for certain with 2000 FL10 that there was no risk, but this time we don't know. And why is that? Well, it was discovered uh, back in April of this year, and it was only observed on two nights, on the 18th and the 21st of April, by a single observatory. Now, at discovery, it was at about magnitude 23, and that's extremely dim. Even most telescopes can't see down to that magnitude unless they're very powerful. And discovering something de novo like that at magnitude 23 is actually quite an accomplishment because the asteroid is constantly moving, so it never stays over the same pixels for too long. It's constantly moving, and so you need to have exceptional sensitivity to pick up something that small, that dim. So, unfortunately, that means they weren't able to follow up on it properly in time, and the asteroid is actually considered lost. We just don't have enough information to accurately predict where it is right now. We literally don't know where to point our telescopes in order to see it. So I'm going to show you why that is. So let's take a look at the uncertainty region of the asteroid. Now I calculated a series of Monte Carlo solutions uh, of the asteroid's orbit as usual in order to display the uncertainty region, and this is what it would look like on October 12th. Let me zoom in here a little bit. You can actually see how large this region is. It's actually huge. And Earth is somewhere in the middle of all this mess. Now we're going to take a closer look here in a second and uh, see if it's possible for Earth to actually run into this asteroid. So there are about 200 asteroid potential positions of the asteroid rendered here. Each blue dot represents a virtual asteroid, a potential position uh, of the asteroid, which satisfies the original data that was collected, which unfortunately is only nine observations on two different nights back in April. And so because we have sh such a short arc of time and so few observations, we just don't know where it is it, within this. It could be anywhere in this, uh, in this area. And if you look at it as a whole, if you look at it as a collective whole, it forms sort of this curved surface. You can see how the orbits are being rendered for each dot here and they form sort of this almost wave shape, this curved surface. Now, if I were able to calculate a lot more of these, if I had a supercomputer, I could fill in this whole region. So imagine that instead of just individual blue dots, that these blue dots were connected, and that it basically uh, forms this uh, polygon surface. 
if, if I could render this as a 3D object, you would see the uncertainty region uh, as an actual curved surface here. And let's see what happens uh, when I play the simulation forward. It starts here on October 12th, and Earth is headed right for that curved surface, that plane of area where all these potential positions of the asteroid are located. And on about October 22nd, Earth actually passes through that region. And unfortunately, that means it's possible, although again, extremely unlikely, but it's possible uh, for Earth to find itself running into this asteroid. You can see that Earth is located between uh, various blue dots here. It's in the middle of several uh, blue dots, and that basically means if I were to calculate a whole bunch more of these asteroids and actually fill in this area entirely so that this entire area was saturated, one or more of these blue dots would be hitting Earth. But I'd have to calculate orders of magnitude more. Uh, even here, none of the blue dots are actually passing through the Earth-Moon system. They're not actually uh, any of them closer than the moon is to us, but you can imagine if I were to fill this in with a whole bunch, uh, with a whole lot more of these uh, blue dots, if I were actually were able to run uh, many, many uh, more Monte Carlo solutions in here, you would see that this area would be filled in, and that means that Earth is in the risk zone. It's not a very high risk. Again, we're talking about somewhere on the order of. 2.2 times 10 to the negative 11th, negative 11th risk. Uh, that's extremely unlikely. You've got better odds of winning the lottery, but we can't completely rule it out. Now, if you look at the nominal position of the orbit up on the NeoDisc website, uh, what you'll see is that it predicts a uh, close approach to be on the 13th of October, and that's already passed. But if we look at uh, the nominal position, which, let me zoom out here, you can see I've added some stars on the end of the name of the nominal position. It's right in the mix of all this, right in the thick of all this. But it really depends on where exactly it is in the uncertainty region. That actually will determine the true close approach state, and it can vary quite wildly because this is such a large region. So if we just plot the distance of the nominal orbit relative to Earth, we see that the, uh, the distance dips down and reaches its minimum on October the 13th, just like the uh, new DIS website says. But if we look at a very different position of the asteroid, which is equally valid in that it fulfills the original data, it actually satisfies the original data that was collected, uh, we can see that on October 22nd, it might actually be much closer to Earth uh, than the nominal orbit predicts. So the nominal orbit predicts that it'll be about 18 and a half lunar distances away, a closest approach. Uh, but if we take a look at a different position, say this one here, uh, 182 K15I2R uh, in brackets 192, if we go to that one and we take a look at its distance from Earth over time, we see that it dips down and reaches its minimum at a very different date on about October 22nd. Actually, it seems to reach minimum on about October 21st, but you get the idea. Here, its uh, minimum distance is only 2.3 million kilometers, as opposed to, uh, let's see here, nominal orbit, as opposed to about, about 7.1 million kilometers for the nominal orbit, so a much closer approach there on the 21st. And if we were to fill this in, again, with even more potential positions of the asteroid, it would actually uh, have some running into Earth. But for every one that runs into Earth, there would be uh, trillions and trillions and trillions more that uh, don't hit Earth at all, which is why the risk factor is so low, because it could be anywhere, anywhere in this region. So if you wanted to find it, where would you even look? You, you, you don't even know where to point your telescope. Do you point it this way? Do you point it this way? Do you point it this way? It could be anywhere in here, so that's why it's considered a lost asteroid. So unfortunately, that means we can't gather more data on it unless we happen to run into it pretty much by chance, almost by luck. We know it would be somewhere on this plane, but this plane surrounds Earth in all directions, so you really don't know where to look for it. But if it were going to run into Earth, uh, it would probably be closer to the Sun than Earth is right now. You can see 
here are some of these positions, some of these asteroids that get closest to Earth on around the 21st to 22nd of October, right when Earth is passing through this plane. You can see where they are on the 22nd here, right? These guys right here. If we go backwards in time to about today, they're closer to the Sun than Earth. And so that makes them hard to observe because if you try to look for them from Earth, you're going to be looking in the general direction, the general vicinity of the Sun. That means you can't see them. It's the daytime. You can't see stars. You can't see the asteroids. They're invisible. So unfortunately, even if it were going to run into us, we have no way of knowing it until it happens. Uh, that's similar to what happened at Chelyabinsk, right? Where a meteor came in and exploded in midair and shattered a whole bunch of windows and injur injured a whole bunch of people, and it came out of nowhere. It blindsided us from the general direction of the sun. And the same thing would happen here. It's just very, 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 very unlikely. And I want to stress that over and over, <coughs> excuse me, over and over again, uh, because I don't want people panicking over this. It's nothing to worry about you're far more likely to be killed by just about anything else that day than this. But we simply can't rule out the possibility because it is a lost asteroid, and Earth actually does unfortunately find itself in the uncertainty region of the asteroid for that day. So how did that happen? I mean, why is it so large here? Well, let's take a look what happens when we go backwards to the date of discovery. Orbital mechanics works in both directions. We can actually rewind time in ORSA and look back to the date of discovery. So, here's a second simulation I did, rewinding time. It starts here, uh, oh wait, no, oh, this is the wrong simulation, sorry. Let me pull up the right simulation. So, let's go to, let's go back to Orsa here, and pull up this one. Here we go. So this simulation runs backwards in time. And let me turn on the orbits center up on Earth. So okay, it starts here on October 14th, and it actually goes backwards in time. So if we go back to April, uh, April 19th, okay, so this is the day after discovery, but uh, you get the idea. It goes forward here to April 21st. That's the second night it was observed. It was first observed on about April 18th, but from April 18th to April 21st, that is the area of time in which it was actually observed. At no time after that uh, did we get to see it. So, unfortunately, that means we have a very good idea of the angle it was relative to Earth and the Sun. You can see it formed, the uncertainty region forms this long line here. We have a very good idea of where our telescopes had to point to see it on those nights, uh, but we don't know how far exactly it was from Earth because we don't have much sampling of time we haven't actually sampled enough time over the course of the orbit to exclude many of these possibilities. It could be at various distances uh, from the Sun and from Earth with very wildly different orbits uh, because we know the general velocity it had on those two nights. Uh, but depending on the distance it was from the Sun on those nights, those velocities translate to very different aphelion distances, very different distances at their farthest point from the Sun. So the uncertainty region forms this nice little line. You get a few outliers. The, the Monte Carlo solutions sometimes break down and just yield ridiculous results, which are just complete outliers like this one and clearly this one. Clearly these don't actually fit the data, but the bulk of them do. The bulk of them do. You can see that they form this nice line that points right back towards Earth, because that's the direction our telescopes had to look to see those at the asteroid on uh, those nights. And if we go forward to April 21st, they're still in a nice tight line. But over time, those orbits diverge and they have very significant effects. Those differences become extremely significant and the whole thing spreads out into a mess, a swarm of possible positions of the asteroid by the current date. So you can see how what started off as at least fairly certain information about the direction of the asteroid over just a few months of time translates to completely uncertain information about even the direction uh, of the asteroid relative to Earth. So I hope that uh, answers some questions and shows you guys the difference between a uh, completely fake threat to Earth, which wasn't a threat at all, 2000 FL10, and real potential threats to Earth, which do exist. There, there are many of them out there at any given time where we don't have enough information on the orbit of the asteroid, and you get situations like this, where you have potentially a very large uncertainty region, but one 
that also happens to encompass Earth. So with that, I hope you have a nice day. Uh, clear skies, folks.